Okay, so uh, hello uh, to Carolina and to the uh, people that is that has come today to this talk on NGOs and advocacy communications for gender equality and reproductive health in international development. It's, it's great to, to celebrate International Women's Day uh, with this talk. Uh, this talk is hosted by the Tutu, the Archbishop Desmond Tutu Center for War and Peace Studies. Uh, the center seeks to promote the study of conflict and conflict resolution, including in its remit the analysis of war, peace, and the phases in between, and embracing the study of both international and civil conflict. Uh, the center is proud and has been proud since 2004 to bring together academics, but also practitioners who work on issues related to peace, war, and conflict from a variety of perspectives. It promotes the benefits uh, of drawing on the interdisciplinary approaches to shed light on the multidimensional challenges that are faced by militarism and deeply divided societies. So to celebrate International Women's Day, we have uh, Dr. Carolina Matos. Uh, she's a senior lecturer in media and sociology with nearly 30 years of professional experience in academia and journalism, having been a former a uh, full-time journalist for 10 years before becoming an academic. She is program director of the MAC in Media Communications and International Communications and Development at the Department of Sociology, City University of London. Matos has also been teaching and researching for over 18 years in universities throughout the UK and has also been a visiting researcher abroad before joining City in 2013. Matos taught at the University of Essex, LSC, Goldsmiths and ULE as part-time lecturer, but also VL. Uh, Dr. Matos obtained her PhD in Media and Communications from Goldsmiths College, University of London in January 2007, with a thesis on the relationship between journalism and democracy in Brazil. Matos researches on media, gender and development, the role of communications for social change and of new technologies, media, democracy and the public sphere, as well as, as health communications, poverty and sexual and reproductive health and rights. So Carolina, it's a real pleasure to have you here. Thank you so much. And uh, let's, let's, let's make a start. Thank you very much for the invitation, Catalina. Thank you, Anthony. Thank you, everyone at Liverpool Hope University. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, yes, so my introduction has been uh, given. I don't need to uh, talk into that. As there's a lot to cover, this is a big project. So I kind of summarized it to fit around 20 or 30 minutes. And so you just have to bear with me. I'm also very tired. Now I'm just right in the end of submitting my manuscript of this project now to my publisher, McQuill Queen University Press. And so I'm in a kind of very crucial stage of delivering the manuscript to the publisher. Okay, so this uh, talk is called NGOs, Advocacy Communications and Use of New Technologies for Gender Equality or Productive Health. It's funded by the Global Challenges Research Fund. Now, um, what I'll be doing here today, I'm gonna to provide some of the key theoretical frameworks that guide this research, particularly in the areas of gender and development, also uh, sexuality and reproductive health, connecting this to inequalities of poverty and structural inequalities. I'll also talk about the case of the role of communications in development and particularly how NGOs who have emerged particularly from the 90s onwards, very, very strong players in, in development and have taken on a position that has somewhat substituted the, the, the state. What we have also in this area of gender equality, a lot of interesting work um, done by these organizations and particularly also in the very difficult and complex area, which is reproductive health, as you're going to see. I'll be talking about the methodology and the partners. I'll give very few overview of some of the findings, a bit of the discussion, the interviews, and also I'll end by saying where I am at at the moment. So you have a glimpse, a snapshot, more or less, of all of the work, and I can fill you in afterwards with the questions. So one of the things that's important to note, and particularly the, the younger generation of feminists will see this even more clearly, the, the third and the fourth generation of feminists. What we have in the last years is seen a kind of almost a renewal of feminism to some extent throughout the world. 
Right, so we go from Ireland to Argentina to Brazil to India. We have expressions of the Me Too movement to a lot of protests that emphasize very much women's bodies. The whole notion of um, the body, the emphasis on uh, uh, agency, the em emphasis on freedom as well as sexuality. So these discussions have emerged quite strongly in the last decades. But as I explore in my work, and this also provides a historical context, these advancements have been ongoing since the 80s and 90s. So it's not new. Simply there's a whole context where, as we're going to be seeing, I'll situate sexual reproductive health within the kind of geopolitical context at the moment. These protests have become more intensified in a context where many feminists have seen setbacks in women's rights, have seen that advancements have not been enough, that the so-called golden decade of the United Nations transnational feminist mobilizing, the achievements of gender equality in the 90s from uh, legislation on decriminalizing abortion to um, discrimination of women to also addressing the gender gap in the workplace and so forth. What has happened is that across the board, there's a sense that women's rights have stagnated. And so this has, has been a kind of revival and a recommitment of looking at women's basic rights. So in terms of the theoretical contribution, so this work is very interdisciplinary. So it's situated within a gender and development sexuality. It also speaks to health communications, NGOs and advocacy communications. Now, the argument here that is seen is basically the ways in which you can use, and my work has dealt with this a lot in the past for those who are familiar, how communications can be used for processes of democratization, for processes of social change. In the past, I've talked more about mainstream journalism, I've talked about public service broadcasting. This work particularly focuses on the third sector, on NGOs and how they are using this Right, so in many ways, people call this also sometimes lifestyle politics, alternative um, uh, politics, etc. Within the debates of feminist theory and the use of communications and online communications in particular for progressive change, what we see, in particular in the field of feminist and health NGOs, they are more and more using communications in a strategic manner in order to promote and shape policy particularly in a moment where setbacks are becoming quite evident. And there's a whole deconstruction around a supposedly gender ideology that has been advanced by progressive sectors in the last years. So these are some of the questions that I ask. How are health and feminist NGOs making use of communications for advocacy in the field? How are these communication strategies used on a daily basis? How could they be improved? How do they combine this both of offline and online activities? So this also work takes into consideration that it's not just about online communications. This uh, up here very much is a complement, particularly because not all organizations are totally in the digital environment. So it also balances to look at both offline and traditional media as well as online communication. And in the context of disinformation, regarding issues of gender equality, and particularly the area of health, reproductive health, and sexuality. So this is very much the context for those who don't know, sexual reproductive health and rights. So this has even been admitted by a recent report from the Guatemala Lance Commission, Accelerate Progress, that sexual reproductive health has not been fully achieved throughout the world. Yes, there's been advancement in the reduction of maternal uh, 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 health of women in the kind of uh, uh, laws that criminalized abortion, in many in more access of women to maternity services and wider discussions about fertility and what have you. But what you have basically is how cultural and social norms and have continued to actually put a, a halt in further progress in the field. What you have is a very kind of complex scenario since the 80s and 90s, so this is not particularly the last years with the rise of Trump in the US with the global gag rule, even with the kind of pressures coming from Eastern Europe yeah, towards uh, uh, civil society players, or even in the case of Bolsonaro in Brazil, you have this oh, actually uh, this conservative uh, uh, attack on gender equality pretty much emerging in the last uh, three decades, but becoming more intensified in the last years. And in particular, this uh, work also 
makes this question very much, to what extent is gender equality actually being undermined by this misinformation around gender and women's rights, particularly in the area of sexuality and reproductive health, almost as fake news, right? So these discourses have proliferated the mediated political public sphere and have contributed for setbacks in many regions of the world. And this is why I look, looked at 52 organizations across the world from the North to the South. And there was a lot of similarities in the type of challenges that they are facing. And what is also interesting is that this um, area of, of women's rights has become even more challenged by the COVID pandemic and sexual reproductive rights in particular as well. So in terms of looking at gender development and reproductive health and sexuality within that, so I'm just going to give a brief overview. So my work talks a lot in detail and provides us a theoretical summary of how feminists have contributed to debates on development regarding women, particularly uh, um, women in, in uh, developing countries who had been excluded from development in the early modernization theory, and then afterwards through Weed and GAD and other theoretical frameworks from liberal feminists to radical feminists and others, women started to be included, not just as um, the second, right, where the man was the main breadwinner, but also as house, not just as housewives, but also as the main householders, right? Women started to be included, right? And this, particularly also from that shift onwards, the discussions have risen to the extent to which that many post-colonial scholars as well as feminists from the global south have argued that women haven't fully been included in development even such despite the influences and the pressures of GAD for instance. What you have seen is that women from developing countries are still portrayed as in need of saving as sometimes reduced to their women's reproductive bodies and almost and this is something that also marked the shift towards sexual reproductive rights. The early discourse was about controlling uh, uh, fertility um, in the third world within a kind of population growth, very much seen as part of a modernization framework, a, a, an imperialist mindset. What you see is a shift towards recognition of women's rights from the 90s onwards. And particularly the work of Cornwall also emphasizes this, how slowly but still with difficulty sexuality also being included within a human rights framework and the need to recognize this within a constructive approach, right? And the differences in sexualities across cultures. So a link was made, particularly from the 90s onwards, this shift in rhetoric towards sexuality and reproductive health. The, as Harcourt has, has pointed out, the notion of looking at the body as a site of political tool, the notion of looking at women as agents and not just the need of saving, and also a more sophisticated understanding of poverty and the connection between sexual reproductive health with poverty as well. The ways in which these is, are interlinked. And here, the work of Chambers is very important in his kind of web of poverty disadvantages, how the emphasis on um, people's access to health systems, plus the ways in which their sexual identities and how they can be stigmatized and marginalized. This can be difficult for them to access information on health and particularly access to productive um, services as well. So this discussion on the link of sexuality related health with poverty and, and women's rights is something that is not always evident, right? And here we are kind of trying to go back to that in a context where we see that structural inequalities of poverty and on gender haven't been fully tackled. And we are in a moment where we can actually go even more backwards, right? So uh, recently a report from Sepal has pointed out that in the case of Latin America, for instance, you have like a decade of going back now because of the pandemic. So these are important challenges that haven't been fully tackled. So this debate is also inserted within discussions of health communication campaigns in development. Traditionally, again, health communication campaigns were very much kind of behaviorist and the ones that were directed to the developing countries were within a message, for instance, that men had to use condoms, a woman had to breastfeed, in a very kind of short term uh, 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 perspective, right, which was also very stereotypical and did not really create genuine change. 
right. So what we have then here is a revisiting, and, and particularly in the last years, the participatory dimension has had a lot of influence within health communication. And I discuss this a lot in the book and the ways in which also communities can participate in their own messages so that these messages are less uh, stereotypical. A bit more on that shortly. So another aspect here is that when you look, as I said, about NGOs, there's a whole literature now from journalism to development that is looking at the role of NGOs in uh, setting pub the public debate, right? Competing with politicians and organizations. And what you have here is a paradox. When it comes to feminist NGOs, they have grown quite a lot from the 80s and 90s, right? Particularly there were more feminist grassroots. What you have is bigger organizations that have been influential in many of these debates. And I have engaged with these organizations. So I'll come to you shortly with one thing where. So in terms of the use of communications in development, there's a whole discussion here of how communications is important for social change and how we can use communications in a strategic manner. And as I said before, not just romanticizing about online communications, right? That this is um, somehow will, will uh, transform everything um, in the world, but rather first recognizing its limits, limits. And here feminist theory has discussed a lot about this, right? So how it emerged, very much tied to the masculine, etc. There are some scholars working on uh, issues on the uh, global south as well that actually celebrate the internet more, uh, less, sorry, and actually see it as actually reflecting the perceptions of northern society that some women are brown and ignorant, but actually in many ways it reinforces. But the reality is, is that online technologies are here to stay and more and more young, the younger population engage very much and get their information from online technologies. So particularly when we look at all of these communities, we're looking at both the ways that traditional media can be in benefit as well as online technology. So a particular aspect that's important here that I've engaged with is how these organizations have used adversary communication strategies for development, for advancement on reproductive health and gender equality. When we look at adversary communications, first like ways put um, uh, highlights to us, what, you have, what he argues is that policy adversary is in itself an exercise in communications. So this is something that I examine a lot in detail in the book the shift away from this early perception of communication as being a one-way flow, right? So health communication campaigns within the modernization theory, the behaviorist tradition, but much within that, information sharing only, sender to the receiver. What we have seen is that communications is much more than that. It, it, it includes dialogue, it includes participation. And when we're talking about embedding more of these adversary communications in NGOs, we're talking about how communications goes much deeper than simply talking about a campaign online, for instance. It requires mobilization, it requires also participation of communities, it requires looking at media critically and looking at how some media can be more useful to others and vice versa, and how to complement that. And these uh, 52 organizations that I engage with across um, the US, Latin America, South Asia, Europe, and the UK, an important aspect is is how different media can actually do different things. So in many ways also, the more in-depth discussion regarding reproductive health, uh, many see it also as being uh, better explored from the traditional media, whereas the online media is a good space for mobilization, for instance. Um, I'll talk more about that shortly. Just in terms of then talking about methodology of the work. So this project, as I said, I'm concluding now, this was an over two years, nearly three years project, so it's been a large research which has included a mixed method approach from uh, interviews with gender experts from the organizations, to interviews with the communication professionals. These um, interviews with communication professionals included a survey questionnaire where they answered questions about how they use communications, including offline, online, their target, their messages, their difficulties, et cetera. The interviews with the gender experts uh, were more kind of assessing the challenges as well as looking to the future, right? So we also did its uh, content and critical discourse analysis of the institutional websites of these organizations, particularly looking at what they put out there, how they engage with the public, 
And we also did a small um, analysis of the social media engagement on Twitter and Facebook in this particular period of um, uh, 2019 when the research started. So the partners here have included um, an Institute of uh, Sociology and Politics in, in uh, Rio, Brazil, which is very well known. Also in India, the Center for Internet and Society. Um, the NGO Repolatina in Brazil, I got to know them through this work. Now they are a partner. And the same goes with the US Global Fund Women that I got to know through the work and now they are a partner uh, moving forward. So PhD students have worked on this in different uh, periods. Uh, they received from the grant that was uh, given to me. I managed to conduct events as well as include the PhD students from public health, um, sociology, as well as communications, India, Brazil, and the UK. And after designing the code book and designing the questionnaires, some of them helped with me with collecting the material as well as conducting the interviews. So in terms of the types of communications, as I said, so here um, I looked at not just information sharing, but also other forms of communication, such as advocacy, community engagement, fundraising, and mobilization. Also seeing an overlap between some of these terms, try to emphasize more and engage with the debate regarding rational and more kind of emotional human interest content, which this is particularly important. It's a discussion that we have also in journalism and NGOs, the use of facts and objective reporting, right? The ways in which a lot of information and the credibility that these organizations uh, have has a lot to do with the reports that they do in this area. But the ways in which many are also engaging more in advocacy strategies that are much more about persuasion, about appealing to people's emotions and human interest stories and digital storytelling. So this is quite interesting and came out as a key aspect uh, de uh, developed in the interviews, how they argue that it's not enough simply to pre present hard facts on how it is important, for instance, to tackle an unsafe pregnancies for teenagers because this is a public health issue. Simply stating that factually is not enough, that basically the combination of rational and emotional and the ways in which, for instance, digital storytelling can actually show the suffering of people and, and engage uh, uh, people in a compassionate with, with the course, how that is also important. So in terms of the code book, we've had looking at all of the organizations, what they had there and what they offered. So in terms of online communications, there's a lot of use of Facebook and Twitter. And this is particularly interesting in terms of how Twitter is more widely used in the northern uh, organizations, whereas uh, Facebook more also in South America. A YouTube is rising a lot, so there's a few differences. Um, and you see the use of blogs, for instance. There was a discussion also on analyzing blogs and how they use blogs. It's just not widely used. And in terms of the in-depth interviews, so as we were looking at um, this issue across the world, right, with a specific more case study focus on Latin America and South Asia, uh, what we did is basically, I. I created a possibility for the interviews to have a scope and flexibility where the person who was applying it there in Brazil or India could include the debates regarding how sexual productive rights are happening in Brazil and in India, which to some extent are also different. In the case of India, yes, there are similarities to uh, uh, far-right politics, religious conservatism, the whole debate on NGOs and, 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 and feminist NGOs, which is also quite vibrant, but you also have in India some stereotypes regarding uh, uh, women and, 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 and uh, men's birth, et cetera, that, and whereas Latin America is very much inserted within these conservative attacks around gender ideology and religion. Right, so these were how we conducted uh, the interviews. The communication questionnaires, as I said before, um, try to look at everything from communications, right? So basically asking them about their successful campaigns, asking them to think critically about how they engage with this issue. If they can, is it a one-way flow? Could they have more conversation? A lot that emerged from here is that, yes, this is still like a topic that is like preaching to the converted. Many people uh, do not understand this and can be that easily manipulated. Right, so in the case of Latin America, for instance, uh, with one of the organizations that I interviewed, a big, uh, the United Nations Population Fund, actually, for Latin America, who are actually doing a, a, a similar study there when I, when I talked to them, uh, 
they argued how gender equality and, and this area was being very influential in elections to the extent that it was used by conservative politicians to attack more progressive politicians and actually kind of equate them with trying to subvert family values to impose promiscuity in young teenagers, to teach sex in schools, et cetera, and et cetera. So the questionnaires dealt with many things, including a censorship, including how they are rethinking this. And recently also, um, when I started the project in The Hague, they had a workshop with some organizations who were exactly talking about how do we construct better messages in for the digital age in a reality of so much complexity and almost like an oppositional climate to the advancement of gender equality. Again, this is a debate that I uh, explore in the book in the context of the revival of feminism that I was talking about. I also argue that at the moment we are living an important moment for feminism, yet it's being attacked, you can argue, from both the right as well as the left in the case of particularly uh, feminism in, in the North and the whole debate about the white feminism and the ways in which uh, the post-colonial critiques haven't been fully um, taken forward, how still there's a difference, what I was saying before about the treatment when we talk about women from developing countries and the third world women. These issues are also discussed with the gender experts of the organizations. And Erin Williams, particularly from US Global Fund Women, argued very forcefully that she sees the importance of the voices of women coming from the South in shaping this debate and providing more gender equality for women across the world, not just coming from the North. These are some samples of the discourse analysis that was done right during the period. So what we have, for instance, um, particular themes that came out, a lot of fact checking, similar to journalism, a lot of kind of a use of information that showed, look, these are the facts, this is a myth, a lot of attempt to kind of deconstruct this uh, uh, gender ideology and misinformation around reproductive health, presenting the facts. That was something that came across quite strongly. Another thing that also came across was the use of digital storytelling about particular people that had uh, experienced difficulties and how they were given a voice. So this was also widely used. And this is a practice, as I said before, which is interesting. And um, international development humanitarian NGOs are using it more and more. There's a big debate around this, how um, personal stories can be influential in terms of creating compassion, but they should not be depoliticized from other political and, 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 and social struggles to the extent to which it's almost like in certain organizations in development, they use some of these personal stories, for instance, to emphasize women entrepreneurs, like um, associating agency as only an individual achievement. So that is a debate that I also discuss in the book, which I find quite rich. And we probably will be talking more about this, particularly in the context of the use of entertainment education for these campaigns. This is something that came up also quite clearly, the ways in which entertainment education style of campaigns can be useful for this type of work to engage people. So these are some of the quotes of the interviews. So the important thing that came out here is how the organizations were willing to speak and how they learned from our work and how I have so much material that I have another two articles to write. One will be for another uh, uh, edited collection, plus another one for a health journal. Um, the material is very rich, very interesting. So it was both good for us in terms of what we collected, so as well as how we shaped and we the thinking of many of these organizations. A lot of things that came out was the differences in equalities of communication use. So some of the organizations who are larger, such as Care UK, Amnesty International and others, have more money, have more support, more credibility to invest in communications, have more political clout, et cetera. Others are very much kind of a smaller grassroots organizations, sometimes working in the margins, pushing more for change. So this is another thing that I did on purpose when I selected these organizations. I wanted to prove across the board, both bigger and more grassroots. But one of the criteria that I was looking for was the ways in which they were influential to some extent in terms of with civil society, presenting debate. So that was a criteria that was used to select them, irrespective of the money and their and their size right, from across the world. Okay, so the debate around um, 
the concept of sexual reproductive health and rights and how feminist groups have advanced this was widely discussed. So you saw there the quote from Caesar's side as well, in terms of a, a particular point that was emphasized was how also this discourse on reproductive health became very much a medical discourse, sometimes is associated from issues of wider women's equality and poverty, as I said before, and this sometimes can be seen as disengaging people as well, as a, a discourse that is too much for a, a professional a medical discourse. So this is something that is discussed in depth in the book, particularly going back also when we look at these issues of menstruation and women's bodies that have their roots in discussion of women's bodies in the 18th and 19th century. And that is very much still with us when um, you have these attacks coming from conservative groups regarding the role of women and the role of motherhood, as well as the whole pro-life versus pro-abortion debate and the rights of the fetus and the rights of women as well, which is something actually quite complex, that discussion. Okay, so I know I'm aware here with time. So just to tell you in terms of where I am now, I'm coming close here to, to the end. So particularly, uh, I received then a bit more money to expand the research. And now, which is what I'm looking at, um, I've recently also conducted focus groups with the Brazilian Repola China. We've looked, we've engaged with sectors of the uh, low income groups, women's groups in Sao Paulo to discuss how they see communications about sexual reproductive health, how they see um, how things should be improved. And in some of the findings that came out from this very strongly fed into what I was saying before about the need of direct language, more simple language, more engaging, more use of entertainment styles, but the, the whole uh, examination or inclusion also of a more a human interest perspective came very strongly as well. And other issues regarding, and particularly many of them also said that this is a discussion that they think that needs to be improved in the public sphere, because what happens at the moment is that there is a taboo, right? This kind of reaction that has come from these opposition groups, meaning that people want these discussions, which is why we had such a big participation in this project, and, but they think that sometimes they feel it's censored to talk more freely about it and in a more um, enlightened manner, that these kind of things we need to discuss in more depth. All right, so this is the data that I'm looking at the moment of the focus groups. And once I submit the manuscript, I will be also um, presenting um, this data. So in terms of the conclusions then, so this is just kind of a very uh, a short summary. Another thing that I'm doing with Rebola China is developing, assisting them in the uh, advocacy communications plan. Um, this is something that came out with some organizations that showed that they were very active in communications, and some said that they want to be more, embedding that in all of it, from policy to everything that they do. A few had communication plans, and this is something that they want. So this is another impact of the research which is coming, which is the development of adverse communication plans for the organizations, right? particularly in terms of media use, discussion. So this is quite detailed in terms of the rationale, the plans, how they engage with different media and messages, et cetera. Particularly the, the, the understanding more of communications also from a participatory perspective. So these are some of the conclusions, the messages sometimes, some organizations argue being about sensitive to cultural sort of, uh, context, others didn't, right? In terms of also engaging with people, and this is the focus groups can answer that, why there is resistance, why do people feed into this manipulation and this fake news about gender equality, et cetera, that feminists want to kill children or what have you, you know, how people can actually deal and deconstruct these myths and these stereotypes around, around women that kind of, and women's bodies that are proliferating the native public sphere and are having an impact and how there's a need to deconstruct, to go back and look at these concepts and also to reach out to people in a way that perhaps these organizations are not doing as, as well. So um, I think that's all from me. Um, I just wanted to make it around half an hour, not to go more than that, so not to also bore you too much with, uh, I think that also provides you with a good overview of the whole work. So I'm happy to answer questions.